Hey everyone, today we're going to talk about the hepatitis C virus. And as always, let's begin by looking at the structure. So the hepatitis C virus genome contains just a single-stranded, uh, non-segmented, positive-sense RNA. And this genome is contained within this hexagonal structure called the nucleocapsid. Um, the nucleocapsid is then surrounded by another structure, uh, which is the envelope. So comparatively simple structure compared to other viruses. Um, hepatitis C virus is a member of the flavivirus family um, which and part of the genus hepativirus, which if you look closely, it actually kind of says hepatitis C virus. So pretty easy to remember the genus uh, in this situation. Compared to other viruses, hepatitis C virus has a large amount of viral diversity. And there's a reason for this. Um, this is because when it replicates, there's no proofreading mechanism. So during replication, what ends up happening is you get a lot of errors and a lot of mutations. Um, this leads to a variety of different viruses, um, but they still, you know, by looking at the RNA sequencing, they still put them in six major kind of genotypes. And, you know, once you look at the various proteins on the structure, you, there's over uh, 100 subtypes. And so it's the development of these proteins that have very hypervariable regions, which helps identify many of these subtypes. And the, the you know the names of the proteins are pretty simple. It's uh, E1 and E2. Within the U.S., genotype one tends to be the most prevalent. Now, because of this high rate of variability, it becomes really difficult to make a vaccine. So this virus has no vaccine available, and it doesn't even have immunoglobulins available. So, you know, as in hepatitis B, you know, you, you really try to vaccinate people and prevention. Hepatitis C virus, we can't do that. Fortunately, as we'll discuss later, there is a great treatment for it. So, you know, that I guess in some ways that does compensate for it. Hepatitis C virus also has a very in interesting pathogenesis. So although it infects the liver and it causes, you know, liver disease, it's actually not hepatotoxic, meaning it doesn't kill the liver cell directly. What it does is it triggers an immune response to release cytotoxic T cells. And these cytotoxic T cells create inflammation within the liver, which ends up killing the liver cells. So it's, it's primarily an immune mediated response that it triggers that ends up killing the liver. It can also lead to development of many immune complexes, which triggers a lot of autoimmune diseases. And as we'll discuss in a little bit, this helps explain why hepatitis C virus is associated with so many autoimmune conditions outside of the liver. All right, so let's start talking about epidemiology of the hepatitis C virus. So according to the WHO, worldwide, there are about 58 million individuals who have chronic hepatitis C virus. And there are about 1.5 million individuals who get new infections every year. So as you can see, this is a considerable worldwide problem. When you look at the US, you can see that it's a growing problem. Uh, between 2013 to 2020, the number of individuals with hepatitis C doubled. And if you go back further since 2005, it's actually quadrupled. So this problem is continued to grow in the U.S., and this is largely due to the opioid epidemic. It's so large that it continues to be the number one cause of chronic liver disease and the number one cause for transplants. As far as transmissions goes, um, it, it is primarily through blood. IV drug use is still a very, very high risk, and it's actually the number one cause of uh, hepatitis C in the U.S. and Europe, it, and it accounts for almost all new infections in those areas. So it continues to be a considerable problem. Some studies have shown up to 50 to 90 percent of people who do use drugs, IV drugs, have serological evidence of infection, so very high rates within this population. Blood transfusions, um, still there, however, as you can imagine, due to screening for uh, antibodies to hepatitis C, it's it's still pretty rare. Sex, sexual transmission does occur as well for hepatitis C. Um, the risk appears to be low in general, but particularly high with people with uh, a lot of sexual partners, and it's much higher in men who have sex with men. Um, perinatal transmission does occur. It's much less than hepatitis B virus, it only occurs about a risk of 5 to 6% risk of uh, transferring from mother to child. So much less than the numbers that you would see with hepatitis B. 
they're all several risk factors that uh, that need, you need to be aware of. Of course, we always already talked about IV drug use. Um, also, alcohol use disorder um, can increase your risk, probably because the alcohol damages the liver. And so if they do get hepatitis C virus, it tends to be more aggressive. Individuals who are incarcerated and individuals who are homeless are also at risk. These are populations at risk. And this is likely related to uh, the prevalence of uh, IV drug use in this population as well. HIV uh, is another risk factor. Um, there tends to be a high rate of co-infection with HIV and hepatitis C, and this just might be just for the fact that they have the similar routes of transmission. Like we discussed, men who have sex with men um, also are at a higher risk, and this is a key population for screening efforts to, to identify these individuals and treat them. Dialysis. Um, hepatitis C virus does tend to be common among patients on dialysis than when you compare them to like the general population. Um, however, with more screening and uh, kind of watching it closer, uh, this, this is declining in this population. So now let's look at the clinical side of hepatitis C. Acute hepatitis C virus refers to the first six months after exposure to the virus. While some of these acutely infected people will clear the infection, a majority will go on to develop a chronic infection. And these transmission rates are much higher than hepatitis B. Anywhere between 50 to 80% of individuals will go on to develop chronic hepatitis C. So this is a very high number. And what's interesting is they will develop chronic hepatitis C, a majority of them, without ever having any signs of infection. And this is one of the reasons why it becomes so important to screen high-risk individuals. Because these individuals in this cr uh, chronic state are basically carriers, and they, you know, they're, they're, the, the disease can wax and wane. And out of this 50 to 80%, a majority of them will develop liver fibrosis. And it's about 70% uh, that go on to develop liver fibrosis. And this liver fibrosis is a very slow, a slow process. Typically, over a 30-year period, um, it continues to grow and worsen until you know they either develop cirrhosis or they develop hepatocellular carcinoma. And it's about 20% of these individuals with fibrosis that will go on to develop hepatocellular carcinoma. So if they're symptomatic, what are the symptoms they feel? Uh, most symptoms are nonspecific and they're primarily ecteric symptoms, um, such as jaundice, nausea, uh, right upper quadrant pain. And these would be typical for all the hepatitis viruses. So just the symptoms alone will never help you identify which hepatitis virus you're dealing with, because this is pretty much the same for all of them. Rarely, it can also cause fulminant hepatitis. Um, again, this is the same for hepatitis B and hepatitis A. Although the symptoms are rare, still keep in mind about 50% of all acute, acute hepatitis in the US are caused by hepatitis C virus. So if you do get a patient with, with an, presents with acute hepatitis, make sure you're looking into hepatitis C virus. With regards to lab, um, amino trans transaminases can be elevated, typically 10 to 20 times the upper limit of normal. Um, but even again, this could be normal. This is highly variable. Uh, so I wouldn't rule out if, uh, unless it's that high. But if you do see a liver enzyme so high, you do want to make sure uh, you investigate hepatitis C. And of course, as you could imagine, bilirubin is also elevated but not uh, with any sort of pattern. Now, interestingly, a lot of in individuals won't develop liver disease, but they will have extra hepatic manifestations of hepatitis C. And this occurs very common. About 38% of the cases of hepatitis C have some sort of extra hepatic manifestations. These are things such as autoimmune disorders. And like, as if you remember the pathophysiology, Keep in mind, hepatitis C is not directly hepatotoxic. It actually triggers an immune response. And sometimes these immune responses leads to immune complex deposition. And so this can lead to like thyroiditis. It can also lead to autoimmune conditions such as uh, Sika syndrome and uh, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. So when you see these conditions, do think of hepatitis C, especially if they're in a high risk group. There's also a number of hematological diseases that can uh, occur. The most common is cryoglobulinemia. And just to, just to remind you, this is when there is a deposition of these circulating immune complexes in the small to medium vessels. And more than 90% of patients with cryoglobulinemia 
are actually infected with hepatitis C virus. And about half of people with hepatitis C have cryoglobulins in their bloodstream. So there's a very strong link between hepatitis C and cryoglobulinemia. Also, cryoglobulinemia can then go on to develop lymphomas, specifically like the B-cell, non hodgkin lymphomas, like diffuse large B-cell uh, and others as well. Because of this association, it is reasonable sometimes to test patients with hepatitis C for lymphoma. Renal diseases can also occur. Uh, again, going back to the immune complex deposition, uh, uh, membrane proliferative glomerulonephritis. Um, there are dermatological conditions such as uh, lichen planus or even uh, porphyria cutanea tarde uh, that can occur, and lichen planus, I'll write that as well. Um, and then diabetes mellitus, because remember, this uh, viruses do sometimes attack the pancreas or the, you know, have, have an inflammatory reaction in the pancreas, and so they can lead to diabetes mellitus. And there are several more autoimmune and extrahepatic manifestations. They'd just be really long to list. But this is, you know, these main ones, whenever you do see a patient presenting with these, it's important to test for hepatitis C as this might be the underlying cause of some of these uh, conditions. Hi, everyone. Sorry to interrupt. I know you're studying hard. I just wanted to pitch our new podcast format for this YouTube video. The Study Spot Shortcast will condense this in-depth video into five high-yield points in just 10 minutes. This will give you the most important points quickly and efficiently when you're on the move. Just search for the Study Spot Shortcast on Spotify. And now, back to the video. So now let's talk about the diagnosis of hepatitis C. So right now there are two primary serum markers for hepatitis C. You first have the antibodies to hepatitis C, and we can also test for the hepatitis C virus RNA, and so that detects the actual viral load. Typically what's done is you first detect a uh, test for hepatitis C antibodies. And if they're positive, then it reflexes to the RNA. And if it's negative, then you don't do the RNA. So do the antibodies first, and then if it's positive, do the RNA after. And most tests within the, uh, like laboratories in the US will automatically do the second part if it's positive. So that way, for example, if uh, there's a lack of follow-up or something, they just still do it. Uh, there are certain conditions or certain situations uh, that you have to be careful. Uh, for patients who are kind of have a weak immune system, uh, individuals who are on hemodialysis, and someone who had like a recent exposure, like a needle stick injury, uh, you have to be careful because they may have, they have a high risk of being antibody false negative for the hepatitis C virus antibodies, and then you never check for the RNA. So with these individuals, you check for both the antibody and the RNA at the same time. But for everybody else, just do the antibody first, and if it's positive, then go over to the uh, RNA. So let's take a look at the scenario where you have an individual who's both positive for the hepatitis B, uh, hepatitis C virus RNA and also positive for the antibodies. Someone with this result, you basically confirmed that they have hepatitis C virus. Now, unfortunately, it's you can't really tell with the, just this test whether it's acute or chronic. However, you can say it's acute if they recently tested negative on a test and recent, you know, within six months. So let's look at the scenario where the hepatitis C virus RNA is positive, but the antibodies are negative. So in this scenario, what you're doing is you're catching it very early, so early that they haven't created antibodies yet. And so now you've just diagnosed someone with acute hepatitis. Finally, you have the scenario where you have a negative uh, RNA, but a positive antibody. And what this means is someone was exposed and then cleared the hepatitis C. So this is someone who's cleared. However, you have to be careful because some individuals with chronic hepatitis C, the, the RNA can wax and wane. And you might have just caught someone with a hepatitis C virus who just happens to be negative at that time. So it's recommended to repeat it in 12 weeks to make sure you haven't caught someone with chronic hepatitis C who's just at that moment where they just happen to be negative for the RNA. So now who do we test? Uh, so there are some indications for screening. And keep in mind, you do want to screen at least everyone above the age of 18 once. And this is because 
it's typically asymptomatic and such a high rate, uh, number of people will go on to have chronic. So many people have hepatitis C who are, have no clue they have it. And as we'll discuss later, there's a really great treatment for it. So you want to make sure everybody gets treated because this is a curable disease. Now, you want to test everybody once, but you do want to do repeat testing on certain people with high risk. And as we discussed earlier, IV drug users, men who have sex with men, and partners of people with hepatitis C, they should be repeatedly tested. Also, people on hemodialysis, because hemodialysis is a risk factor. Pregnancy, because remember, there is perinatal transmission. So you want to test every time someone is pregnant. Also, you want to test anytime someone has liver disease, because part of the workup for why they have liver disease is to uh, rule out hepatitis C. And finally, like I discussed earlier, individuals who come up with these extra hepatic manifestations, such as the cryoglobulinemia, uh, lichen planus, you do need to consider uh, ruling out hepatitis C as the underlying cause for these autoimmune conditions. So now let's talk about how you manage a patient who is positive for hepatitis C. So recently, hepatitis C management has undergone a revolution. And this has been due to the development of direct acting antiviral medications, or DAA for short. Right now, there's four primary medications on the market, Apclusa, Harvoni, Maverit, and Zapatier. Now, keep in mind, these are actually trade names. In actuality, all these medications uh, are combination pills. And so these combination pills are derived of two medications from three different classes. Um, these are your RNA polymerase inhibitors, the NS5A inhibitors, and your protease inhibitors. And so you can see, for example, Epclusa is made up of sofosbuvir, velpotasvir, and just hearing that, you can see how difficult it is to say, and it's also difficult to memorize. And I've still yet to meet anyone who just doesn't use the trade names. In the real world, the infectious disease doctors are the ones who specialize in managing this. And so it's unlikely to come up on USMLEs. Primarily, the reason for mentioning it here is just for the sake of completion. Out of all these four medications, I think one of the biggest things you can just know is Epclusa tends to be the preferred medication. Um, there used to be that depending on which genotype you had and certain different factors, you would pick one medication over the other. But now it's kind of just going towards Epclusa as your first treatment. What is the reason that this is a revolution? Well, it's a revolution because this medication has a cure rate of 97 to 100% such a high cure rate. And when we say cure, that means that you've achieved sustained viral resistance or SVR. And what this means is there you, uh, you cannot detect any hepatitis C virus RNA at 12 weeks after you completed the therapy. And you would imagine with such a medication, you would have, you'd experience a lot of adverse effects because if it has such a high cure rate, it must be very aggressive. But in actuality, it's pretty well tolerated. People may have some minimal symptoms, but people do well with it. And rarely do you have to discontinue it due to some adverse event. However, in one thing to keep in mind, it can cause hepatitis B virus reactivation. And that's just because uh, hepatitis C uh, gets weaker and that causes hepatitis B to start, you know, coming out and affecting the liver. So you got to make sure they don't have hepatitis B and you do need to monitor the liver enzymes. And although it's, uh, it's outside the scope of this lecture and even practice, um, you know, depending on whether they have cirrhosis or they have liver uh, kidney disease, uh, you want to choose different medications. So, of course, since you have a medication here that is up to 97 to 100% cure rate with a very little adverse events, you pretty much want to uh, treat everybody with hepatitis C virus. In some cases, in the acute infection, um, you some people will decide not to treat and just see if there's a spontaneous resolution. And this can happen for many reasons. Um, you know, these medications still are pretty expensive. So maybe due to cost, you could just wait and see and just recheck in 12 weeks. And what you want to do is, you know, maybe the body will just take care of it and there'll be the fortunate, uh, you know, 50% about that actually are, are able to clear the virus on their own and then you don't need medication. If they're not able to clear it on their own, then you want to treat with either Epclusa for 12 weeks or Maverit for six weeks and then recheck again to make uh, you know 12 weeks after cessation to make to make sure you have sustained viral resistance. So as you can see, this is very exciting. We have a 
great medication, which with a such a high cure rate, very low adverse effect. And I really help, I hope that there's other viral, uh, for, uh, there's similar medications made for other viral syndromes uh, that are just as effective as this. So thanks for dropping by and watching this video. I hope to see you soon.